Hey everybody, I'm Steve Shooter, and this is the maiden voyage of shredding the gnar. I bet you thought for the first episode I'm going to be interviewing some cool surfer dude. Well, I'm interviewing a cool embroidery lady who has just finished making the world's first ever embroidered surfboard. You heard me correctly. So have I got your attention now? Cool. We've got to create something cool here for people to understand the narratives around people who love the ocean. Because that's what this is all about. It's the connectives that we have, our combined love of the ocean. So I'm going to be talking to environmentalists, conservationists, marine biologists, activists, surfers, all the sorts of peeps that give a damn about the ocean. I just got to say thanks to the people who make this possible. Fermented drinks are good, they keep your gut healthy and brew kombucha just happens to be the best kombucha on the planet. Prior eyewear, cool shaved out of Cape Town. Holmes, sick threads out of Durban. Road mic SA, you can hear my dulcet velvety sound. Seasick threads, this dude makes the best board bags on the planet, handmade in Australia. So now we're gonna jump into episode one with Daniel Clough. You're gonna learn all about embroidery, that's right. Just when you thought it was for your granny, old uncle. It's not, it's for you and me. I mean, we all wear cool clothes, right? Well, this craft, an artisanal craft, dates back thousands and thousands of years, dudes and dudettes. Listen, get involved, follow her Instagram. All the links are gonna be down below. Please remember to hit subscribe, hit like, and every second week there's gonna be a new interview with some really cool people. You comment down below on this video, you could stand a chance of winning yourself a hamper to the value of 5,000 smacks, and you know what those means. Five. So we're going to jump into episode one of Shredding the Gnar with Daniel Clough about all things embroidery. Daniel Clough. Clough, yeah. Clough. Clough, like rough or tough, okay. yeah. Okay. It's not the easiest thing. <laughs> but you're neither of those, rough nor tough. But I like to think tough. You're a yeah, little from, rough from Fishhook, and I like to think tough. Yeah. And okay. Tough spirited, maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A bit of a calamity, always injuring myself. So tough like that, yeah, yeah. But um, you're not so clumsy behind the. Embroidery needles, behind the threads? Yeah. Um, not so clumsy, you know, but definitely scattered. Like if you think about, well, if one thinks about traditional embroidery and how the back is supposed to look like the front and how, like, it's so particular and like a lot of people have got negative connotations with embroidery because of that because of the stigma of like how particular and precise it had to be whereas the back of my embroidery is just like chaos really so, yeah i didn't realize that the back has to be just as impeccable as the front technically yeah wow. yeah a tradi like a traditional embroidery would would be wow. like that okay yeah. and um you mentioned to me earlier that you you've kind of grown up learning to sew and so it's always it's, it's a deeply ingrained love yeah my mom um my mom used to sew so she used to make like clothes and stuff and i think because of that like fabric was always around the house and needles and the sewing machine was always out so it was kind of i never really thought of it as a creative outlet it was just something that like every in my mind everybody did and creativity was like painting or, mm. or photography or whatever so yeah there's always just this comfortable medium that i had around only later realized how much kind of creativity was in fabric and sewing and wow. yeah. how young were you when you first kind of got into embroidery so I studied um, fashion design just after school mm -hmm. but even before then I was making my own clothes like really hideous jackets and skirts that you know didn't fit but I'd like to wear them anyway and then the embroidery kind of started happening I studied at a place called red and yellow which is advertising school in yes, the school I remember that. do you remember yeah. <laughs> and it was set above a fabric store so people in my class would draw these like characters and then we would run downstairs and we would buy fabric and I'd make these plush toys and kind of draw the details of the plush toys on and that those details kind of I kept drawing them and the drawings became a little bit more complicated and complex and I kind of thought I had, had invented this art form and I called it thread sketching I was okay. yeah wrong I okay. didn't invent it it had been around for centuries but kind of that was the inception of it was around 2013 what made you progress from that to you know the full-on detailed embroidery that you do today like how did that cross over I think the the transition happened round about I was studying and I was drawing these details and then I was working at a gallery and I had nothing to keep my hands busy except for some scrap fabric that was in my bag from making these plush toys yes. and then I 
it's like quite embarrassing. I was given a laptop to work. I couldn't open the laptop, but I found out later I had it the wrong way around. Anyway, but just to like make sure that I looked like I was doing something, I started drawing on <laughs> I started drawing on this scrap piece of felt and I drew this rabbit. And that was kind of when I realized that there was like a whole limitless like creative outlet that could be attached to fabric a thread and a needle and i kind of i guess use it as one would use like a paintbrush or a pen or a pencil yeah and then that just opened the floodgates and just started doing more and more and more and more and more yeah are there a lot of people doing what you do to your sort of level um I would say, you know, in 2016 when this started, it felt like there was a very small community of, of young contemporary embroiderers. Now it's become huge. I mean, a lot of people, especially I think with lockdown, people wanting to do stuff with their hands and like craft, the whole kind of craft movement yeah. that's happened. I seem to think that it's like flooded and there's so many people who are doing it, but I think that's also just the echo chamber that I'm in. It's like my community. But it's, it's a strange thing. I mean, I guess it's like anything. Once you start seeing it, you see it everywhere. The, the idea of adorning and embellishing clothing has been around since like ancient Vikings. You know, every we've been doing it since the beginning of time. Sure. It was one of the most prestigious careers. We associate it with grannies because grannies do do it. And, they, and there is a huge community of like, you know, guilds mm. around the world. So I think young contemporary embroiderers are definitely growing, but about 20 yeah about five years ago there was maybe i would say comfortably say like 50 of us oh wow now it's yeah different now there's a lot more a lot more yeah but i mean you're not just any embroiderer you're somewhat of an instagram sensation oh uh, well, <laughs> I, like, uh, I mean the number numbers are it's almost relative you know it looks like maybe big numbers but it's it's you always like concerned about getting throttled and your reach and your audience and and it's just it's really a facade at the end of the day it doesn't change much maybe except that people think you're a bigger deal than you are um there are a lot of embroiderers that are also sitting on half a million followers wow. i feel i feel pretty small in comparison <laughs> to them yeah but yeah i'm i'm really grateful i mean i got i got picked up by the right platforms at the right time that i think helped me build like a really loyal beautiful audience mm. Are a lot of your audience like in terms of demographic do you understand who your audience your target audience is yeah my my target audience is late 20s to like uh mid 50s women usually most women I actually have quite a big following of like early 30s gentlemen okay. uh, men which is really cool uh and also just the embroidery community, the way that it's opened up to men is really amazing. There are lots of men that are sewing now. So it's it's really cool to see how it's like changing. I do kind of know my audience, but I think it's sometimes I, I find, you know, if I think too much about it, I cater my work to other people. And then that voice becomes louder than my own voice. So mm -hmm. I try my best to kind of put the social media mayhem Aside. In this idea. Yeah. What is yeah. your favorite subject matter? Is it like flowers? Is it flora and fauna? Or is it people? I, I love portraiture. I think okay. portraiture is definitely my favorite. I think it's it's a lot more um, challenging than other other things. I think that it's also you know you can get so much emotion in it. I love like doing pop culture portraits because of how people connect. You know, and the, yep. the nostalgic aspect of it, especially because there's already like a nostalgia connected to the embroidery. Like, oh, my granny used to sew, and then you're yes. doing it with like Tupac or Biggie or something like that. Or Jeff so you, Goldblum. Oh, Jeff Goldblum. So I really enjoy that. There, there's kind of like a an irony in it, and mm. and. Yeah, I really, I really enjoy portraiture, but also another thing with the flora and the fauna and, and um, kind of other subjects. I, I think a part of why I choose what I choose is to either challenge myself, so mm. using a surface that's different, like sewing on old like scrap metal or fishing net or whatever, and then you know some subjects like flowers lend itself better to being on a tennis racket than say I don't know um, mm. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think portraiture is definitely my favorite. Are you are you in any way connected with any environmental initiatives? Um, I do have like my Bob Ross prints, and then all my Bob for every Bob Ross print, um, I plant a tree, and that gets print that gets uh, planted in the name of the person who's bought the print. So they like little like little oh, initiatives good. here and there, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't um, I could definitely be better. Like, the cottons and the stuff that you work with are they all ethically like are they African cottons? Or? So so the cottons that I work with, I'm a I, I'm a 
Jean Stitcher, or an affiliate with um, DMC. So DMC are like the oldest embroidery company in the world. Run DMC. Uh, run DMC, <laughs> exactly. Look the DMC sewers. Yeah, exactly. All just Look like... the DMC stitches. In a pose. Like all these zimmers. <laughs> Shot with like a wide <laughs> angle lens. Um, so most of my cottons and threads and stuff are coming from them now. Okay. And then I've got a beautiful like huge basket of these hand tied threads from a South African company called House of Embroidery and then I love working with their mist dyes so they have these hanks a hank is like basically a big chunk of thread okay. and they're all supposed to be dyed a specific color so yeah. when they just don't get the right color they become mist dyes and those are my favorites oh, because okay. they're nothing none, no two are the same no two are the same and they've got their own like they're they're kind of like the misfits which I love you know they've got their the real character so I work with a, a lot with those but Unfortunately, the the fabric cotton fashion industry isn't that eco-friendly. Even even when you think you are being as ethical as possible, there's there's always glitches in it. You know, even mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. vegan shoes are problematic in their own way. So I try what I try to do is I make sure that like I don't buy stuff. So I work, I, I use my threads, or I get gifted threads, or I, I get threads that are from estates or okay. secondhand stores. I never buy new beads. I always buy beads from secondhand stores and stuff like that. Or um, just break apart old jewelry by using old like fabrics or old clothes, things like that. So that I'm cool. always trying not to. I'm trying not to feed too much into the purchasing mm. aspect of of um, of the process. Process. Yeah. The upcycling. Yeah, upcycling, reuse, repair, that kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. And and what made you get into Wavescape? I was asked to be a part of the Wavescape. Um, I think it was about two years ago, and I kind of had couldn't wrap my head around it and I think that I think that I kind of my apprehension was was palpable they reached out to me this year and I was like I, it, everything felt right I had like I'm ready I was ready I had like kind of blocked off a big chunk of time because I've, I've been wanting to um, experiment with making bigger pieces and different types of portraiture and it was just yeah I just worked out perfectly awesome well we can't wait to see the board it's busy getting glassed right yeah, so it's in process. I'm going to go uh, film it, I think, next week. Uh, we've got like a whole strategy. We're just, I think everybody's like got their fingers crossed that this works out. Because it's the first embroidered, I think it's going to be the first hand embroidered surfboard in the world. So, How or, cool is that? It's so first cool. Ever. Like, what made you choose the Protea and yes. the Sunbird? Yes. So, so I was um, suggested by a friend I was going to do this kind of series of birds of paradise because I just love the long tails mm. and just like the idea of how that kind of mimics threads and just and I was going to do it on these scrap um, pieces of metal these gates that I've got from a scrapyard I have a favorite scrapyard as as everyone should have yes and no naturally doubt. and um, where do you keep these gates in your flat in my garage okay yeah I share a garage with somebody and I don't oh, think they're cool. impressed with how many like scrap pieces of metal are like slowly accumulating in the front of the garage <laughs> but, uh, she's but how patient. do you embroider on metal so you build a base with wool and okay. then you essentially uh, that becomes like the fabric oh wow yeah so um yeah I wanted to do the birds of paradise and this long tail and then I was like well this would be a great opportunity to do that because it's such an open brief and then kind of thought I can't do a bird of paradise like a South American bird this is like this is mm. such a beautiful like local event I live here where everything is happening to like take this outside of home just seems so like counterintuitive so I was like oh looking at different South African birds and then I thought of the Cape sugar bird and the male Cape sugar bird with that beautiful tail and then obviously he would sit on a protea because you know what's more what's African more exactly so that's kind of the the idea of the board so it feels to me it feels like home yeah and i like the idea that if the board even if the board went overseas if somebody bid on it from america that it would still be ours you know it would mm. still be about the money would stay here and and it would still be like a part of like our thing mm. yeah Good. and did you and did you have to use a certain type of cotton or or i don't sorry Thread, yes, yes, thread, yeah, cotton, strand, yeah. string, whatever you call it. Yeah, yeah. I don't even know what to call it. Is it like super light, obviously super lightweight, right? Actually, I don't know. I mean, I used everything. So I used tapestry wool, okay. I've used um, bamboo cotton, I've used rayons. Rayon is a synthetic mm -hmm. cotton made out of nylon. So a whole bunch of different stuff, all through the, from this brand DMC, because okay. I, like, I know that their stuff is um, color fast. 
so that's obviously a big important thing that if you don't use cheaper threads it doesn't bleed into yes. when bleed when it gets glassed but I mean we don't really know so the whole thing we just knew it couldn't be higher than a certain like thicker than a certain I can't remember I think it's two mils but we just, I just we have to all it's gonna experiment work. It's gonna work. <laughs> yeah, the resin will do its thing bond yes yeah. so like when I when I mention or think of embroidery um, my mind prior to having seen your work because I wasn't one of those firstly I'm not in my early 30s and secondly I'm not one of those guys that would naturally sort of think of looking at embroidery as a as a hobby but like when I hear the word embroidery and correct me if I'm wrong here Foster because you might also agree but you think of <laughs> something that maybe your granny used to do and like crochet and all yes, that, you know, and of course, it, it knitting, is, yeah. yes, knitting. And I mean, it is, I know crochet for sure, and, and knitting is very on trend with a lot of mm -hmm. you know, young people now. And, and what's cool with what you're doing is, like you said, you're taking characters that young people can connect with, like Tupac and whoever, and, yeah. and you're making embroidery so much more of a connect for them. And yeah. it's almost, uh, you, you know, for me, that's like what. When I looked at it, I was like, oh, check it out, it's Jeff Goldblum. And then it's characters that I associated with. And all of a sudden, embroidery became something completely different for me. Yeah, and I guess maybe also the characters, the nostalgia kind of connections and the pop culture connections make it accessible. Mm. Um, which is not like by design. I definitely didn't like strategize that in the beginning. Like, how do I make this medium accessible to, to the youth? It was more just like... I really love this I'm gonna do or like watching Pulp mm -hmm. Fiction and being like oh, I love Mia Wallace and then like doing an embroidery of it because I, I think it's really like I connect to it um, but I think embroidery that this I mean I'm obviously obsessed with it I'm so so involved and invested in the embroidery fiber fabric community and and history and the more I, I throw myself into it the more I realize like this has been a part of what we've been doing for forever like we've been embellishing our clothes we've been like showing our status embroidery was the most like well-paid as highly esteemed profession in the world at one point wow. yeah and it's, it's got so much like there's so many interesting things behind it it, it spans every culture any every generation mm. the first um and the only all-female language is actually an embroidered language from south china where only where women would write notes to each other on gifts Wow. and they couldn't you know so there's so so cool <laughs> it's so cool so romantic as well it's so cool and so romantic and um and i think like because of that i don't see the same like stigma of of it being granny art and mm. i see that as being like one kind of way that it has been seen but i also felt the same way i was like and when i do go to the, i do go to the guild every now and then and yes. i am probably the only one sub 60 in the room but yeah i think it's awesome that like you exposing everyone to how cool embroidery is yeah. and the beauty of it and the intricacy of it and and what you can do with it it's just it's been sort of frozen in time and thinking Compe that like we need to embroider a picture of an english countryside with of trees course. and you know yeah whereas um no man embroider up in spongebob square pants if you want to but the thing is you are 100 percent not wrong with that stigma i mean that is the that perception is 99.9% yeah. .9 of the perception of what this medium is. But it's just, it's so cool for me to, to um, I guess, because I'm invested in it and anybody who's into yeah. what is, I get essentially a subculture. Yeah. And be that change that is. Yeah. Come on, guys, start embroidering. Yeah, start stitching. Start stitching. Well, I mean, a close friend of mine called Tom from Seasick Threads, he makes he makes board bags. Oh, cool. And, um, yeah, I mean, he's also one of my sponsors. And... He makes board bags for um, Jeff Bridges, Cameron Diaz. Amazing. Yeah, and 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 he literally sits and sews. What do you mean? He's just, he sews. He sews the board bags Beautiful. by hand himself. Beautiful. And there's so much story that goes into it when yeah. you do it by hand, and it's got. And I think that's also it. Is that and why it's become more popular, and why mm. you know, um, it's just the hand, the hand like told stories and, and investing actual time and physicality into something you know we have just got such a digital age everything feels so instantaneous and then disposable and yep. can disappear into your back pocket you know whereas like you know that you've made something by hand even if it ends up at the bottom of a shoe box you've you've like you know it's lived next to you for however long it mm. took you to make yeah and so what would be your proudest moment on this journey if you could just 
pinpoint one other than being on the BBC with Jeff Goldblum <laughs> picture. That was cool. That was cool. That was cool. I, I did a job for Gucci I'm really proud of. Oh, um, wow. That was really cool. Yeah. I mean, I look back at it now and I'm like, because I did it quite a long time ago, I'm like, oh, could have done it better. But you know, you, you're only as good as yes. you can, you only know what you know. Um, but oh, I don't know. It's really tough. Like, I, I think. I think my my grand sent me a, a picture of her holding up like an article I was in and that was really cool and I know like my grandfather before he passed he saw me on TV and it meant so much to him so those are the things I think so that the really moments, the yeah. beautiful moments you know yeah it's it's cool it's cool it's always nice to it's always nice to feel like you're on the right track and get affirmation for that where to next for you what's um, happening you, other than this artboard project what have you got have you got a five year plan oh Oh, like a like a th- like a three day plan. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. I know I know how I'm gonna get to the weekend. Um, <laughs> barely. I'm working on an album cover now, which I'm really excited about. Wow. And um, I've got a um, a workshop in Canada coming up, so that's really cool. So I teach as well. So I've got, I've got an online class launching. I'm a Skillshare original teacher, which means that they produce the class, and then um, which is really cool because I got to work with an amazing team to shoot. So it was really nice to have their backing. Brilliant. Um, so yeah, so teaching, doing a workshop in Cape Town, and then one in Canada, and um, and then I'm spending a month in Rosendahl, which is in the Free State. And I've kind of got this idea of a body of work that I want to start building. I feel like I need to break through into like another um, level of my portraiture. I would like to be a little bit more conceptual um, and bring my own photography back into my work. So I know that that's going to take like wrapping my head around a lot of practice. Mm. So I'm kind of booking off time and doing an artist residency in the middle of the free state. Beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. Nervous, but excited. Like, let's say there's a whole bunch of young peeps that are watching us and they're going like, how can I get into embroidery? Like, like just give them a little crash course on what they need to do, where they can go. We'll put all of uh, Danielle's links down below for you to join whatever classes that you do. Yeah. I think that's probably the quickest, right? Yeah. And sign up for one of her classes. Sign up for a class or um, YouTube has just got like an abundance of how to's and you know how to thread a needle how to tie a knot how to everything everything is available out there so i've okay. got like a very specific way that i work which is kind of chaotic but like it it's my way and so i teach that but there are so many i always believe like whether it's with drawing or painting or embroidery or whatever it is do the thing that you like find the part of the process that brings you joy and then build your craft around that so whether it's photography and it's documentation then like go out take those photos see and then and build your craft around what you love and what fulfills you you know so that's kind of like i think it, that would be my my advice to any upstart embroiderer any upstart artist even an accountant you know mm. Well, thank you, Daniel, for that insight into your world. (laughs) Absolute pleasure. We have a load of budding new embroiderers.